So this talk is called Hawking on the Edge of Space-Time. This is Stephen Hawking. He died in 2018. He was an English theoretical physicist. And this is the article that Stephen Hawking wrote. It's called On the Edge of Space-Time. So he starts off the article with a brief history of physics up to Newton. That's too short and not worth dealing with. But however, picking up on a bit to Newton. He says, uh, this model with the Earth at the center was adopted by the Christian church. It was the great attraction that it led plenty of room outside the sphere of the stars for heaven and hell. They quite how these were situated was never clear. It remained in favour until the 17th century when the observations of Galileo showed that this model of the universe had to be replaced by the Copernican model in which the Earth and the other planets orbited around the Sun. Not only did this get rid of the spheres, but it showed that, and it's not quite accurate up to here. Really, the Earth and the Sun orbit around a Barry center. Which is the center of mass. Um, you consider the whole solar system and it's got to move around uh, the center of mass of the solar system. And this Barry center keeps changing its position. It's roughly near where the sun is though. But it's still not quite an orbit around the sun. So the claim that the Earth orbits the sun is an approximation. It's more accurate to say that it orbits the very center. Uh, but given Hawking leeway, many people use the approximation that the Earth orbits the sun. So the geocentric model of the sun orbits the Earth had to be replaced by heliocentric model where Earth orbits sun. And that had to be replaced by the sun and Earth orbit the very center of the solar system. Uh, considering other motions such as our solar system moves in our Milky Way galaxy, then other updates might be necessary. A point though, Often students taught that Earth orbits the Sun, but often gets omitted is telling them that is an approximation. Similar issues, other things they are taught, often not told they have been what they're being told is approximations. It can cause a great deal of confusion if they don't realise they are being taught approximations. Anyway, continuing on. As the article goes on, he says, not only did this get rid of the spheres, but it also showed that the fixed stars must be at a very great distance because they did not show any apparent movement as the Earth went around the sun, apart from that caused by the rotation of the Earth about its own axis. Having realized this and having abandoned the belief that the Earth was at the centre of the universe, scientists were led fairly naturally to postulate that the stars were other suns like our own and that they were distributed roughly uniformly throughout an infinite universe. This, however, raised a problem. According to Newton's theory of gravity, published in 1687, each star will be attracted towards 
every other star in the universe. So sort what is a general thing. If you solve one problem, it often leads to creating another problem. It carries on. This, however, raised a problem according to Newton's theory of gravity published in 1687. Each star would be attracted towards every other star in the universe. Why then did not the stars all fall together to a single point? Question mark. Newton himself tried to argue that this would indeed happen for a bounded collection of stars, but that if one had an infinite universe, the gravitational force on the star caused by the attraction of the stars on one side of it would be balanced by the forces arising from the stars on the other side. The net force on any star would therefore be zero, and so the stars could remain motionless. This argument is in fact an example of the fallacies one can fall into when one adds up an infinite number of quantities. By adding them up in different orders, one can get different results, which basically means the mathematics of dealing uh, with infinite quantities is very confusing. We now know that an infinite distribution of stars cannot remain motionless if they are all attracting each other. They will start to fall towards each other. The only way that one can have a static infinite universe is if the force of gravity becomes repulsive at last distances. Even then, the universe is unstable because if the stars get slightly nearer each other, the attraction wins out over the repulsion and the stars fall together. On the other hand, if they get slightly further away from each other, the repulsion wins and they move away from each other. So I want to point out here, it's uh, Roger Boscovich from the 18th century and Hawking admits talking about him. And he worked on extending Newtonian physics to consider what happens when there's retractive and repulsive forces and he gets this force curve. As you carry on with what Hawking says, he says, despite these and other difficulties, nearly everyone in the 18th and 19th centuries believed that the universe was essentially unchanging in time. For such a universe, the question of whether it had a beginning was metaphysical one could equally well believe that it had existed forever or that it had been created in its present form a finite time ago. So the use of the word metaphysical, uh, because metaphys metaphysics means beyond physics. And so you're trying to dismiss something from being physics when you call it metaphysical. So Hawking continues and he says, the belief in a static universe still persisted in 1915 when Einstein formulated his general theory of relativity, which modified Newton's theory of gravity to make it compatible with discoveries about the propagation of light. And I dispute that. That is uh, where a lot of the mess starts. But anyway, carrying on. Einstein added a so-called cosmological constant, which produced a repulsive force between particles at a great distance. This repulsive force could balance the normal gravitational attraction and allow a static uniform solution for the universe. This solution was unstable, but it had the interesting property that in its space was finite without boundary just as the surface of the Earth is finite in area, but does not have any boundary or edge. Time in this solution, however, 
could be infinite. Hawking continues, Einstein's static model of the universe was one of the great missed opportunities of theoretical physics. If he had stuck to his original version of general relativity without the cosmological constants, he could have predicted that the universe ought to be either expanding or collapsing as it ha happened. However, no one realized that the universe was changing with time until astronomers such as Slipper and Hubble began to observe the light from other galaxies. Visible light is made up of waves like radio waves only with a much shorter wavelength or distances between wave crests. If one passes the light through a triangular shaped piece of glass called a prism, it is decomposed into its constituent wavelengths of all colours like a rainbow. Slipper and Hubble found the same characteristic patterns of wavelengths or colours as for the light from stars in our own galaxy, but the patterns were all shifted towards the red or longer wavelength end, wavelength end of the rainbow or spectrum. And really it's the majority which uh, red shifted. There's a rare number that are blue shifted. Anyway, the only reasonable explanation of this was that the galaxies were moved away from us. In this case, the distance between the wave crests would be increased. Similarly, if one observed light from a source that was moving towards us, the wave crests would be crowded up and the wavelength would be reduced. The effect known as the Doppler shift is used by police to measure the speed of cars. During the 1920s, Hubble observed the remarkable fact that the redshift was greater the further the galaxy was from our own. This meant that other galaxies were moving away from us at rates that were approximately, were, were roughly proportional to their distance from us. The universe was not static as had been previously thought, but was expanding. The rate of expansion is very low. It will take something like 20,000 million years for the separation of two galaxies to double, but it completely changes the nature of the discussion about whether the universe has a beginning or an end. This is not just a metaphysical question, as in the case of a static universe, as I shall describe, there may be very real physical beginning or end to the universe. And this is what Hawking thought back then. And subsequently to that, the cosmologists are sort of changing their mind on certain things. But carrying on with what Hawking believes in this article, so carrying on with what Hawking says, the first model of an expanding universe that was consistent with Einstein's general theory of relativity and Hubble's observations of redshift was proposed by the Russian Alexander Friedman in 1922. However, it received very little attention until similar models were discovered by other people towards the end of the 1920s. The Friedman model and its later generalizations assumed that the universe was the same at every point in space and in every direction. This is obviously not a good approximation. And I'm making a note that's interesting. He's suddenly dealing with the word approximation when, when maybe you could have talked about things being approximation earlier. And so he says, back to what he's saying, this is obviously not a good approximation in our immediate neighborhood. There are local irregularities such as the earth and the sun. And there are many more visible stars in the direction of the center of our galaxy than in other directions. However, if we look at distant galaxies, we find that they are distributed roughly uniformly throughout the universe the same in every direction. Thus, it does seem to be a good approximation on a large scale. 
even better evidence comes from the observation of the background of microwave radiation that was discovered in 1965 by two scientists at the Bell Telephone Laboratories. The universe is very transparent to radio waves of a few centi inches, and he probably means centimeters. Might be a typo mistake there. Wavelength. So this radiation must have traveled to us from very great distances. This is because any large scale irregularities in the universe would cause the radiation reaching us from different directions to have different intensities. Yet the observed intensity is the same in every direction. He continues, there are three kinds of generalized Friedman models. In one of them, the galaxies are moving apart sufficiently slowly that the gravitational attraction between them will eventually stop them moving apart and start them approach, approaching each other. The universe will span to maximum size and then recollapse. In the second model, the galaxies are moving apart so fast that gravity can never stop them and the universe expands forever. Finally, there is a third model in which the galaxies are moving apart at just the critical rate to avoid recollapse. In principle, we could determine which model corresponds to our universe by comparing the present rate of expansion with the present average mass density. The mass of the matter in the universe that we can observe directly is not enough to stop the expansion. However, we have indirect evidence that there is more mass that we cannot see. Whether this invisible mass could be enough to stop the expansion eventually remains an open question. And he refers to another article on that. In the Friedman model, which recollapses eventually. Space is finite but unbounded as an Einstein static model. In the other two Friedman models, which span forever, space is infinite. Time, on the other hand, has a boundary or edge. In all the models, the expansion starts from a state of infinite density called the Big Bang singularity. In the model, which recollapses, there is another singularity called the Big Bang, Big Big Crunch at the end of the recollapse. Singularities are places where the curvature of space time is infinite and the concepts of space and time cease to have any meaning. Scientific theories are formulated on a space time background and consequently, consequently they will break down at a singularity. And when he means breakdown, science, i.e. physics, breaks down, can't deal with physical reality in such circumstances. If there were events before the Big Bang, they would not enable us to predict the present state of the universe because predictability would break down at the Big Bang. Similarly, there is no way that we can determine what happened before the Big Bang from a knowledge of events after the Big Bang. Now contrast that with what is now being said. The Big Bang no longer happened, no, no longer means what it used to mean. The Big Bang has had its goalpost moved since when Hawking was talking about it in 1984 i.e. it's been revised. Anyway, Hawking tries to talk around the problem of the possible origin of the universe. He carries on like this and he says this means that the existence or non-existence events before the Big Bang is purely metaphysical. They have no consequences for the present state of the universe. And the trick he's using there is he's using the word metaphysics, that meaning beyond physics. So since he wants to talk about physics, things he can't deal with, he's going to call metaphysical and he's going to say that's not part of physics. Anyway, 
he does have another trick he uses. And where he says, we might as well apply the principal economy known as Occam's razor to cut them out of the theory and say that time began at the Big Bang. So that's a good trick. What you do is you ignore what you can't deal with. And when he carries on, similarly, there's no way that we can predict or influence any events after the big crunch. So we might as well regard it as the end of time. Yet another good trick where he's saying, might as well regard it. And when he carries on now, the beginning and possible end of time that are predicted by the Feynman solutions are very different from earlier ideas. Prior to the Friedman solutions, the beginning or end of time was something that had to be imposed from outside the universe. There was no necessity for a beginning or an end. In the Friedman models, on the other hand, the beginning and end of time occur for reasons of dynamics. One could still imagine the universe being created by an external agent in a state corresponding to some time after the Big Bang, an external agent. Well, that's probably metaphysical sort of thing is God, but anyway, passing. But it would not have any meaning to say that it was created before the Big Bang. From the present rate of expansion of the universe, we can estimate that the Big Bang should have occurred between 10 and 20,000 million, million years ago. So now he goes on to consider divine intervention. Many people would dislike the idea that time had a beginning or an end because it expect of divine intervention, i.e. God. There were therefore a number of attempts to avoid this conclusion. One of these was the steady state model of the universe proposed in 1948 by Herman Bondi, Thomas Gold and Fred Hoyle. In this model, it was proposed that as the galaxies moved further away from each other, new galaxies were formed in between out of matter that was being continually created. The universe would therefore look more or less the same at all times, and the density would be roughly constant. This model had the great virtue that it made definite predictions that could be tested by observations. Unfortunately, observations of radio sources by Martin Rye and his collaborators at Cambridge in the 1950s and earlier 1960s showed that the number of radio sources must have been greater in the past, contradicting the steady state model. The final nail in the coffin of the steady state theory was the discovery of microwave background radiation in 1965. There was no way this radiation could be accounted for in the model. Anyway, my comments are the latest revision of the Big Bang Theory that the universe might have always existed sounds to me like resurrecting the steady state theory but in a different form. All ideas do get resurrected sometimes. So Hawking continues, another attempt to avoid the beginning of time was the suggestion that maybe the singularity was simply a consequence of the high degree of symmetry of the Friedman solutions. This restricted the relative motion of any two galaxies to, to be along the line joining them. It would therefore not be surprising if they all collided with each other at some time. However, in the real universe, the galaxies would also have some random velocities perpendicular to the line joining them. These transverse, Velocities might be expected to cause 
the galaxies to miss each other and to allow the universe to pass from contracting phase to an expanding one without the density ever becoming infinite. Indeed, in 1963, two Soviet scientists claimed that this would happen to nearly every solution of the equations of general relativity. They base this claim on the fact that all solutions with a singularity that they had that they constructed had to satisfy some constraint or symmetry. They later, they later realized, however, that there was a more general class of solutions with singularities which did not have to obey any constraint or symmetry. So now we're getting on to pointing out that relativity is incomplete. And this is from what Stephen Hawking is saying. This showed that singularities could occur in general solutions of general relativity, but it did not answer the question of whether they necessarily would occur. However, between 1965 and 1970, physicists proved several theorems which showed that any model of the universe which obeyed general relativity satisfied one or two other reasonable assumptions and contained as much matter as we observe in the universe must have a Big Bang singularity. The same theorems predict that there will be a singularity which will be an end of time if the whole universe recollapses. Even if the universe is expanding too fast to collapse to its entirety, we nevertheless expect some localized regions such as massive burnt out stars to collapse and form black holes. The theorems predict that the black holes will contain singularities which will be an end of time for anyone unfortunate or foolhardy enough to fall in. So I'm saying now that Hawking is talking about general relativity being incomplete, incomplete and the reason it's incomplete is that because it doesn't have the uncertainty principle. And he comes up with what is called Hawking radiation. So this is what Hawking says. The real problem with space-time having an edge or boundary at a singularity is that the laws of science do not determine the initial state of the universe and the singularity at the singularity, but only how it evolves thereafter. This problem would remain even if there were no singularity and time continued back indefinitely. The laws of science would not fix what the state of the universe was in the infinite past. In order to pick out one particular state for the universe from among the set of all possible states that are allowed by the laws, one has to supplement the laws by boundary conditions which say what the state of the universe was at any initial singularity or in the infinite past. Many scientists are embarrassed at talking about the boundary conditions of the universe because that feels that they feel that it verges on metaphysics or religion. So metaphysics beyond physics. So once again, you're starting from physics and you're ending up with things beyond physics. After all, they might say the universe could have started off in a completely arbitrary state. That may be so, but in that case, it could also have evolved in a completely arbitrary manner. Yet all the evidence that we have suggests it evolves in a well-determined way according to certain laws. It is therefore not unreasonable to suppose 
that there may also be simple laws that govern the boundary conditions and determine the state of the universe. So as I say, note the use of the words metaphysics and now linking that with religion. Uh, physics can only go so far and then runs out of being able to give answers. So I'm skipping a bit now about his speculations. We get to this. What happened at the beginning of the expansion of the universe? Question what he asked. Did space time have an edge at the Big Bang? Question mark. The answer is that if the boundary conditions of the universe are that it has no boundary, time ceases to be well defined in the very early universe just as the direction north ceases to be well defined at the north pole of the earth. Asking what happens before the Big Bang is like asking for a point one mile north the north pole. The quantity that we measure as time had a beginning but that does not mean space time has an edge just as the surface of the earth does not have an edge at the North Pole, or at least so I'm told. I have not been there myself. So he's talking about the North Pole and you're considering the North Pole on a sphere. That's a two dimensional surface and you're not considering the third dimension. So it's a bit, um, a bit of a difficulty there. You could have uh, direction north the North Pole, just you would be going along uh, a third dimension of space rather than confining yourself to the two dimensional surface of the Earth. And the other interesting thing to note is uh, he's talking about time having a beginning, and I think with the latest things they're saying about the Big Bang their thinking time didn't really have a beginning there was a time before what what was considered the origin of the universe time anyway he continues if space-time is indeed finite but without boundary or edge this would have important philosophical implications it would mean that we could described the universe by a mathematical model which was determined completely by the laws of science alone they would not have to be supplemented by boundary conditions we do not yet know the precise form of the laws at the moment we have a number of partial laws which govern the behavior of the universe under all but the most extreme conditions however it seems likely that these laws are all part of some unified theory that we have yet to discover. Speaking of unified theory, uh, these physicists in all mention there was unified theory of physics before Einstein. And this is the unified theory which I'm talking about. It's in this history of physics article by a physics historian he mentions about this there was a Victorian theory of everything. Hawking is just another example of a physicist that we ignore the that this this earlier theory of everything. And in my view that's where they all started to go wrong. Anyway, continue with Hawking. He says, however, it seems likely that these laws are all part of some unified theory that we have yet to discover. We are making progress and there is a reasonable chance that we will discover it by the end of the century. Well, he's talking about the end of the 20th century and that didn't happen. And the final words from Hawking in the article are, at first sight, it might appear that this would enable us to predict anything in the universe. However, our powers of prediction would be severely limited. First, 
by the uncertainty principle which states that certain quantities cannot be exactly predicted but only their probability distribution and secondly and even more importantly by the complexity of the equations which makes them impossible to solve in any but very simple situations thus we could still be a long way from omniscience which means knowing everything so if you have a theory of everything it's probably too com complicated to solve the, ma the mathematics to be able to get answers to questions you want to ask thank you and that's the end <laughs>